On the last video, we learned about render loops. On this video, we're going to learn about triggers and colliders. With this triggers and collider, we're going to be able to know when some object touches another object. So let's get started. First of all, let's create the floor. Then after that, let's create a cube. Let's add a rigid body to the cube. And let's duplicate the cubes. Now that we have the cubes, let's create a seizure script and name it collider test. And also let's create another seizure script and let's name it trigger test. For that, let's drag and drop the trigger test to this cube and the collider test to, to this cube. Let's also set to not use the gravity on our triggers and mark the box colliders as triggers. Now let's open the trigger test and let's delete all this and create our code. Triggers are used to let the game object tell us when another object has go through this object. So there are three main overrides that you can use on a trigger. And that are on trigger enter, which gets called once when a new Collider, another game object has touched the, the this game object. On trigger state, that is a callback that gets called repeatedly until the collider exits. And on trigger exit, that is called only once, and it's when the collider finishes touching the object. So this code, what it does is that when other object touches our cube, we are going to change the color to a random color when the, when it enters the cube. When it's staying, we are just going to print which game object we change the new color. And when it exits, we're going to set the color that we have to white on the other object. Now, let's save it and let's check it out real quick. So we hit here, we select the object, and when we touch it, check out that it changes randomly. Now, let's do the same for the collider. Colliders work the same as the triggers. They have three overrides, on collision enter, on collision stay, and on collision exit. The difference is that to use them, you need to have rigid bodies. In order to access the other object of the touching object, you need to access the collision instead of the collider. So always when you use collisions, you need to access the rigid body. So remember, triggers can be used to access other objects and they don't use the physics engine so you can use them so let's say know when a player goes through a door while colliders use the physics engine and you cannot go through the other object in the last video we learn about triggers and colliders on this video we're going to learn about the special kind of triggers which are the mouse triggers so let's get started. First of all, let's create a seizure script and let's name it mouse interactions. Second of all, let's the mouse interaction script to all of our cubes. Now let's open our mouse interaction script and let's paste the new code. Now there are five special callbacks that are used on the mouse which are on mouse enter, on mouse over, on mouse exit, on mouse down, and on mouse up. They are called only if the mouse is over the game object. And to know if the mouse is over the game object, you need to have attached to the object you're testing the script, a collider. You don't need a rigid body, but you need a collider. So they are called special triggers because they act as callbacks when the mouse is over the game object. Now on mouse enter gets called only once when the mouse is over the game object. So when we are over the game object or the mouse enters the game object, we are going to calculate a random color and we are going to set it to our game object. On mouse over gets called every frame the mouse is over our game object. 
And what we are doing here is that we are going to change the color over the time to black. On mouse exit, gets called only once when the mouse leaves the game object, when it finishes touching the game object. And what we are going to do is we're going to reset the color of the game object we are touching to white. Finally, on mouse down, gets called when we left click the object. And on mouse up is called when we release the left click of the object. And what we are doing here is to disappear the object by disabling the render the renderer of the object. So let's check it out. If we touch, if we go over any object, we're going to for the first time set a random color on any of the cubes. If we leave the mouse over the object, we are going to change the color over the time to black. Now, if we leave any game object, we're, the color is going to be set to white. Now, if we click any object, the object automatically disappears. But when we release the click, it appears again. So remember, five special functions for the mouse. On mouse enter, on mouse over, on mouse exit, on mouse down, and on mouse up. And they only get called if the object has a collider attached to it. Hi. And welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. In this section, we're going to cover the basic scripting entry points in Unity and other basic stuff. So what we're going to learn here is exposing variables in the spectrum scripts. We're going to see the entry functions when scripting, render loops, triggers and collisions, and a special kind of trigger that are the mouse triggers. So let's start. In this video, we are going to learn how to expose bars from our scripts. First of all, in order to set a basic scene, what we're going to do is to click on File and then Save Scene. And here, we're just going to name our scene. So, to expose bars from our script, what we're going to do is to create basic feature script. And let's name it Camera Script. Second of all, we're going to, to attach this camera script to our inspector. And after that, we're going to open the script. Let's remove these functions, which we're not going to use. And let's have a couple of bars. Our speed, boost, player name, and a starting position. Notice that the starting position is a private bar, okay? So let's save this script and let's go back to Unity. Let's wait until it compiles. Let's check the main camera and here we have our three bars. Notice that the private bar, our starting position is not going to appear here. And this is because it's a private bar. But in order to see it, its value, we just click over here and hit debug. Here we're going to see the, the status of the private bar, but we're not going to be able to change it. So, now that we have our bars exposed, we can change their values on the inspector. So let's say we want a speed of 1, a boost of 10 times the speed, and we're going to have player name name it ASD. Notice that these values are not, are not changed, but when we create another game object and we attach our created script to the new game object, these values are the ones that are going to be used. But the final values that this script is going to have on this game object are the ones that appear on the inspector. So that's pretty much everything. See you in the next video. Now that we know how to expose bars in Unity, we are going to learn how to move this game object to another position and how to show the values of the speed and the boost and the player name on the log console when we start the project. So let's get started. First of all, let's double click our camera script. After we have opened the script, we are going to create two functions, the awake function and the start functions. 
The only way to execute our code on the engine for the first time is via the awake function or the start function. Now, the difference between these both is that the awake function is called when the script instance is being loaded. Also, the awake function is used to initialize any variables or game state before the game starts. The awake function is always executed before the start function. Now, on this awake, what we are doing is setting the position of the game object to the start to our starting position, which in our case is zero. And also showing on the console the new starting position of our game object. On the other side, the start function is called before any of the update methods are called for the first time. The update methods or the render loops are the methods that we're going to learn on the next lesson. Now, the start is only called once in the lifetime of the behavior. The main difference between the start function and the awake function is that the start function is only called if the script instance is enabled. So this allows us to delay any initialization of the code. Let me show you real quick. So, let's say we have our game object here, right? And I'm going to disable the script. So if we hit play, we are going to move the game object to the new position, which is the execution of the wake function, which is setting the position to the starting position. But if we have this disabled, we are not going to show the log of the player name and the speed and the bust values. But if we enable this script, we automatically, we are going to get the player name and the speed and the bust values shoved on the console. So that's pretty much it. Two entry point functions, the awake function, which gets executed before the start function, and the start function, which gets executed before the render loops. Now that we have learned the entry points in Unity, on this video we're going to learn the different kinds of render loops and when to use them. So let's start. First of all, let's open the camera script. And we're going to create two little bars, an update delta and a fixed delta. These bars are going to be used to show the difference between the render loop that we are going to see next. We are going to create three functions, an update function, a fixed update function, and an GUI functions. These three functions are the render loops. These functions get called several times per frame. So. The update function gets called every time per frame if the menu behavior is enabled. On the other side, the fixed update function is called every fixed frame rate and is used mainly for physics calculations, for movement of rigid bodies and that kind of thing. On the other side, the ungui function is mainly used to draw ungui data and is called several times per frame. So. We have these little two bars that we were creating on the, at the beginning of the script and we're going to assign a bar that gives us the engine that is the delta time and is the time in seconds, in seconds that it takes to complete the last frame on the render loop. So you will think that it will be the same this bar than this bar, the value that it gives, but it varies from render loop to render loop. So let's see. If we hit play, we are going to have on the update delta a different delta time, but on the fixed update delta we are going to have the constant delta time. So even though the bars are the same, the delta time gets changed between the different render loops. Finally, on the ungui function, we have a label that shows us the player name, the speed, the boost, and finally to show the difference between the fixed update render loop and the update render loop, we're printing the update delta and the fixed delta 
which they both get calculated on the different render loops. That's why there's a difference in the delta time between each render loop. So, remember, there are several kinds of render loops, but the main ones that Unity uses are the update function, which gets called every frame when the mono behavior is, is enabled, the fix update, which also gets called every fixed frame rate, and is used mainly for physics calculations. And finally, the ungui render loop, which is called for rendering and handle GUI events. Hi, welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. In this section, we're going to learn about components. What are components, how to add them, how to remove them, how to access another components, how to access components that are on other game objects, the use of them. So let's get started. On this video, we're going to learn how to remove components from a game object, like this. Be a scripting. First of all, let's start by explaining what is a component. Every game object in Unity has components. Components are parts of every game object that fulfill a specific function. For example, we have here a camera component, which makes rendering available on the plane. We have, for example, a mesh render, which makes our plane be able to be rendered. One thing to notice is that every game object in Unity has a transform, and is the only component that cannot be removed. Also notice that components can be disabled or enabled, and also can be removed, or can be added again via component, and selecting the component we want to add. Now let's check some scripting. In order to do this example, we're going to need a cube with a rigid body, so we can use the physics, and a plane. So let's start by creating our cube. And on this cube, let's add a component of the rigid body. And let's place our cube accordingly to be over our plane. Now let's add our plane. And what we are going to do is, via scripting, we are going to remove the mesh collider so the cube can go through the plane. So let's start by creating a C -sharp script and let's name it remove add collider. After that, let's open the C -sharp script and let's remove this and let's paste our code. So what we're doing here is that on the update render loop, we are going to destroy the component of the mesh collider when the user presses down the escape key. And when it releases the key, we're going to add the component again. The destroy function works in different ways. You can pass a component or you can pass a game object. If you pass a component, you're going to, to remove the component of the game object. But if you pass the game object, you're going to delete the game object. Also, you can pass a second parameter. And what it does is that it's, it is specifies the time in seconds from now until the game object gets destroyed. So if I call destroy now, this component is going to be deleted after five seconds. So let's see. If I have this, I'm going to attach it to the plane. And if I hit play and I press escape, the component gets destroyed. But when I release the key, it gets added again. So remember, the destroy function can be used in several ways. If you pass a game object, you delete the game object. But if you pass a component, delete the component of the given game object. Now, to add a component, you just call add component on the game object and you pass the type of the component you want to add. In the last video, we learn about how to add and remove components and what are the use of the components on the game objects in Unity. On this video, we're going to learn how to communicate or connect components that we write in order to access bars or call functions from another script on the same game object. So let's start. First of all, let's start by creating a new user script and let's name it playing GUI. This is going to contain the GUI on our playing game object. Second of all, let's create to know if the component is being shown or is being hidden when we press or release the escape key. And let's name that flag collider available. Make sure that it's public so we can access 
this bar from another script. Now, let's set the bar to false. If we are destroying the component or removing the component and let's set it to true, if we are adding the component again. Finally, let's create a simple function just to call it from the other script, just to show how to call functions from other scripts. Now, let's move to our other script. I made plain GUI, let's open it and let's paste our code. So, basically, what we are doing here is to print the flag that we created on the remove at collider script. And how do we do that? We just call the get component and pass the type of the script, which in our case is remove at collider, and then just call the bar. Remember that we can call the, co the bar as it's public. And the same thing we do for the simple function. We just go here, create a button, which is we just name it call function, and we just get the component, pass the type of the script, and then just call this function. So let's check it out how it works. Notice that I have the, the, here the game object, and if I press escape, the mesh collider is going to disappear, and this value should be set to false while I have the escape key pressed. Now if I release it, I get added the component again, and the value goes back to true. Now if I call the function, if I press the button, I get the call of the function on the console log. So remember, to access another component from your script that is attached to the same game object, you just need to call the get component function and pass the type of the script you're, wa you're wanting to call. And you have to be sure that the access level of the bar or the access level of the function is set to public. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. On the last video, we learn about how to access a custom component from another component. On this video, we're going to learn how to access from our script any other component. So let's start. Now, the goal on this video is to be able to disable or enable the mesh render of this component. And as we don't know the API of the engine or the functions that we can call on each component, what we do is that we just click on the little book with a question mark on any of the components in order to see which are the properties and the details of the component we want to work on. Now, this page just gives an overview of what the component does and what the component properties are and what we can do with the component. But if we want to go to the code, we just click over here on switch to scripting. And this will show us all the functions that are available for this component. Each of these functions can be called after we call the get component of mesh render. So if we want to know what are the values or the type of bars that each of these functions have, we just click on each of the functions and then we will know what type of the bar is or the function and what we can do with it as it has a little description. Now, in our case, what we want to do is to enable or disable the component. Now we know that it receives a bool and that's what we are going to use on our script. Also, some of these functions and bars on the scripting reference have examples which are pretty usable in some cases as they teach some pretty useful things. Finally, you can change between the languages of the examples. So now I have it all my examples on JavaScript, but we can change it to C sharp, which is the language we are programming on this course. Now let's go back to Unity and let's open the plain GUI and let's paste our code. So we are creating here two buttons, render off and render on. And what we are doing here is this, that we are going to get the component of the type mesh render and we're going to set the enable bar to true if we press the on and to false if we press the off. Also notice that there's another way to call the get component function and it's by passing string, but you still have to do a cast to the component you want to use. At the end, it turns out that it's way better to use the generic version of get component. Now let's check it out how it works. So if we call the render on, 
it will show the render, but if we call it off, it will disappear the render of the plane. So remember, whenever you want to use a component and you don't know the API or what functions to call on that component, you always have the documentation, which offers a great list of options that you can call on the component. In the last video, we learned about how to access from a custom script that we create, a component that comes with the engine. On this video, we're going to learn how to access another component from another game object. So what we are going to do is to turn the lights on or turn the lights off from the plain GUI script. So let's get started. In order to turn on or off the lights, what we need to do is to access the directional light game object and enable or disable the light component. With that, we are going to turn on or off the lights. Notice that the component we want to disable or enable, it's on another game object. So what we are going to need is to create a reference to the game object. So let's do it. Let's create the reference. And let's fill the reference. So we have the game object here. And let's drag and drop the directional light game object here. So now we have the, the reference of the game object on our script. So we can access the component from here, from this game object. Now let's paste our code. So here we have two buttons, one for turning the lights off, the other one for turning the lights on. Notice that we use the same function, get component. We pass the type of the component, in this case, the light, and we just set enabled, false if we are turning them off, and enable to true if we are turning them on. Also, if you notice, there's another way to call the reference to the game object, and it's with game object that find, and you pass the name of the game object. The problem is, is that it's slower, as it has to, to go through all the game objects, and the other problem is that if you change the name and you don't remember that you changed the name and you're using game object define, it will give you another reference. So let's see, for example, let's say I'm going to add a space here on the directional light. And if I call the function lights off, I will get another reference exception because the directional light doesn't have spaces on the light. So remember, there are two ways to call the get component on another object that is not placed on the same game object we're calling the script from. One is getting the component from a reference, and the other is game object that find, and finding the game object by the name. The problem is with the game object that find is that it's slower, and if you make a mistake on the string that names the game object, you will get a null reference exception. Also, if you pass the reference, it will be way faster. So whenever you can, try to pass always the reference. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. On the last video, we learned how to access from a custom script another component that it's on another game object. On this video, we're going to learn how to access all the children game objects from a game object and be able to paint it from another script. So let's get started. First of all, let's take the cube and let's duplicate it. Let's reduce the scale and let's duplicate it even more. Now that we have this, the four little cubes, let's parent. How do we parent? We just select the cube we want to parent and we drag and drop them inside the root cube or the father. Next, let's open the plain GUI and let's create a reference to our new game object and let's name it the snake object. Now, let's go back to Unity and let's fill the new reference that we have on the plain GUI script. And we do it by drag and dropping the reference. Now, let's open our plain GUI script and let's create a function that will receive a game object and a color. And what this function is going to do is going to go through all the game objects that are the children and paint it with the color. But before we explain this, what we're going to do is to create a button to call this function. And let's name it change color. So here we have the function that is being called here. 
So in this function, what we receive is the root game object, which is the parent of all the children, and a color, which is randomly calculated here. Now, the main part, all the function is this line. And here's how it works. We call get components in children, and we pass a type, and this will return us an array of this type. With this array, we just go through all the array here, and we change the color to the one we calculated on the parameter. Notice that if any of the objects that are children from the parent doesn't have this type of component, it will get skipped. So if you want to be sure that you go through all the objects, you will have to pass a transform component, which is the only one component that it has to be on any object in Unity. So let's see how it works. If I hit change color, it will change the color on all the game objects that are inside the parent. So remember, to access a component from a parent and all the children, you just need to call the get components in children on the parent game object. Pass a type and it will return you automatically the type of the component that all the children have. One last thing to know about this function is that you have to bear in mind that the objects returned on the array are not in the same order all the time. So be careful with that. Hi, and welcome to getting started with Unity 4 script. This section, we are going to cover all the input management system in Unity. So, what we're going to do is that we're going to give a small overview to the input manager. We're going to learn how to connect the input manager with our scripting. We're going to learn the difference between access and keys. We're going to dissect the specific key presses like up, down, stay, and we're going to define all of them. And finally, we're going to see what is the mouse input and how it does it works. So let's get started. On this video, we're going to learn what is the input manager, how does it works, and how can you access it. So the input manager is where you define all the different input access and game actions for your game. And you can access it by clicking on edit, project settings, and input. Here you will get all the keys that are assigned on the input manager. All the access that you set up in the input manager serve for two purposes. They allow you to reference your input by axis name in the scripting, and they allow the players of your game to customize the control for their liking. Now, each of these axes has certain values, but the principal ones are the name, which is the one that we're going to refer to on the scripting, a descriptive name if you want to give a brief description of what the axis does, a positive button and a negative button, which are the keys that are going to be pressed. An alternative, negative and positive button. And the type. The type tells us if the button or the axis is going to be a key or a mouse button. If it's only going to be mouse movement. If we're going to have a joystick axis. Or if we're going to refer to a window movement. This window movement is for when the user shakes the window. Now the axis is the axis of input from the device. If it's a joystick, a mouse, a gamepad, etc. And finally, the joystick number, which joystick should be used. By default, it's set to retrieve the input from all the joystick, and this is only used for input access and not for buttons. Now, let's see how the input manager gets shown on our build project. So let's click on File, Build and Run. So here we have our game. We have the Graphics tab and the Input tab. And this will show us all the access that we have specified on the Input Manager. Now, our users will be able to change all the keys from this tab. So remember, in order to access the Input Manager, you go to Edit, Project Settings, Input. And you have all the input keys here. Always try to use the Input Manager as it allows you to reference your input access from the scripting and then afterwards when you want to change any key or button you change it on the input manager and you don't need to change it on the script so that's pretty much see you in the next video on the last video we learn about the input manager how does it works how to access it, and how it gets displayed when we build a project. On this video, we're going to learn how to connect the input manager with our script in order to move a cube. So let's get started. First of all, let's create a cube, and then let's create a light so we can see how the cube moves. 
After that, let's create a C -sharp script and let's name it Input Handler. Now, before we open the script, let's open the Input Manager and let's remove the 11 axis and let's just leave three axes. Let's name the last control, the last axis to random route. And finally, let's set the positive button to space and let's remove the alternative positive button. Notice that the gravity and the sensitivity are set to 1000 versus the vertical, which is set to 3. This is because we are going to use the vertical and the horizontal axis as an axis. We will see later how this works, but for now, just know that the horizontal and vertical axis are going to behave like a joystick axis. Now, let's open the input handler. Let's remove this and let's paste our code. So, what this code does is that we receive input from a button that we created on the input manager named random rod. And we also receive as an axis the values from the horizontal and vertical bars that we created on the input manager. So if you remember, we have binded the random rod to a space as a positive button. So when we hit the space here, we are going to rotate randomly the current transform, in our case our cube. Now, when we hit the horizontal button, which is binded to the left and right buttons, what we're going to get is a value between minus 1 and 1, depending on which button we press. So if we set as the positive button the right key, we're going to get 1 when we press the right key. But if we press the left key, we're going to get minus 1. This is because we are treating as an axis the horizontal and vertical buttons on our input manager. So here we calculate which button we press and we multiply it times a speed which we set it as a public value on, our, on the inspector. Now after everything has been calculated we just rotate the cube. Finally let's go back to Unity and let's drag and drop our script to the cube. So remember two ways of accessing our input manager. One is by pressing a button, in our case which is a space, and we randomly rotate the cube. And the other one is by getting an axis from the input manager. Also, remember that when you want to treat the ax as a button, you just call an if. And when you want to treat the ax as an axis, you just call the input.getAxis. Remember that the positive value returns 1, and the negative value returns minus 1. In the last video, we learn about how to set values in the input manager, how to create axes, and how to create buttons. And how can we connect the axes that we create in the input manager with our scripts. On this video, we're going to learn the difference between axes and keys. We're going to see how do you, do you create an axis and how do you create a button. Also, we're going to see when and where do you need to call each of those. So, let's get started. First of all, let's open our input handler. And then, let's paste our code. Now, what this code does is that we are just simply printing on GameView three labels that just gives us the info about the input.getAxis for the horizontal, for the vertical, and the get button. So let's see how it works. Let's go to Unity and let's hit play. Now here we have the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, and we are pressing or not the button. So if I hit the random rod, it will change to true. So it has one value, on or off, true or false. Now if I press the horizontal axis, the positive button, it will move from zero to one. And if I press the negative button, it will move from 0 to minus 1. The same happens to the vertical one. Now, if I go and open the input manager, we can see how the gravity and the sensitivity affects our axis. So if I change this value, let's lock the inspector. If I change the vertical value of the gravity to, let's say, 1000, you can see how when I move up, will go to zero pretty straightforward. Now if I change the sensitivity to 1000 as well, it will move from zero to one without moving through all the values that are inside zero and one. Using small values on sensitivity and gravity is pretty useful 
for let's say example when you want to start to move a character so it starts slow and then gets to a normal velocity also notice that we had the random rod the gravity and the sensitivity set to 1000 and that's because the random rod has true or false values has zero or one value we don't need values between zero and one we just need on or off true or false so remember in order to have a smooth transitions you can always play with the gravity and with the sensitivity also in order to call the axis for values between zero and one you can always call input.getAxis and pass the name of the axe you want to use and if you want to use the axe as a button we just call input.getButton and pass the axe name in the last video we learned about the difference between axes and buttons on the input manager we learned about how to play with the sensitivity and gravity and we learned how to use them if we want to access the button or the axis. On this video, we are going to focus on the buttons and we are going to dissect the different states that each button has. So let's get started. First of all, let's open our input handler script and let's start by creating our code. Now, as we learned in the last video, there are different ways to treat the input manager. We can treat it as an axis and as a button. Now, if we are treating it as a button, we have three different functions that the engine provides in order to get the state of the button. One is when the user presses the key. The other is when the user is pressing frame by frame the key. And the last one is when the user releases the key. Now, what this code does is that when we're the first time we press the button, we are going to change randomly the color of the game object that this script refers to, in our case, the cube. After this, when we press frame by frame the button, we are going to rotate randomly our cube. Finally, when we release the button, what we are going to do is that we are going to print on the console log what color we calculated, what color we generated here. And finally, we are going to print the rotation that we generate when the button was pressed frame by frame. Notice that all these input calls are always made on the update loop. We don't use the ongoing loop to use the input handling because the ongoing loop gets called several times per frame. So if you call the get button down or the get button up on the ongoing loop, you will get several times through this statement. So it will print you several times the debug.log on this case. Anyways, let's try the code. So let's hit play and check out that when I hit the random rot button, it changes automatically. And if I keep pressing the button, you will see that the button gets a random rotation every frame. Now, if I stop pressing the button, we will get the log that we printed when we release the key button. So remember, the input manager on the buttons offer three states for each key that we press. When we press the key down, when we continue pressing the key frame by frame, and when we release the key. Also remember that all the input handling has to be done on the update loop and not on the on GUI loop. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. In the last video, we learned about the different states that a button has. It has on button down, on button when it gets called frame by frame while the button is pressed, and on button up that is called when the key or the button gets released. In this video, we're going to learn about the management of the input of the mouse, which is not managed on the input manager that has certain special functions that can be accessed from the engine. So let's get started. First of all, let's open our input handler script and let's paste our code. And also, let's place a small label that will print us the mouse position. Now, the mouse position is displayed in pixel coordinates, where the bottom left of the screen is at 0.0, .0 and the top right of the screen 
is the screen width or screen height. Also, the mouse, as the buttons, offers three functions that we can call. The get mouse button down, get mouse button, which gets called frame by frame, and finally, get the get mouse button up. Notice that here we enter an int. This int refers to the different mouse buttons. So, zero for the left button, one for the right button, and two for the middle button. Now, what this code does is that we cast a ray from the main camera crossing with the mouse position. Now, if the ray hits something, we will capture any event that happens with the mouse. So when we press the button down, what we're going to do is to calculate the screen point of the object we hit. Now, when we have the screen point, we're going to use the Z value of the screen point to calculate a starting offset for where the right hit. Now the offset gets calculated using the position of the object we hit minus the world point calculated by the screen points of the mouse and the screen point Z coordinate that we calculated here. Now while we are pressing the button, we are going to calculate the current screen point which is just the merge of the position of the mouse and the screen point. And after we have the current screen point, we are going to calculate the current position of the object we hit. And this current position gets calculated again by moving the current screen point that we merge here and adding the offset we calculated when we start pressing the mouse button. Finally, we set the position of the object we hit with the current position we just calculated. And at the end, we just print when we release the button, the last position that the game object had when we release the button. So remember, you can always access the mouse position and also access when the mouse gets pressed down, when the mouse is continuously pressed frame by frame, and when the mouse button gets released. Hi, and welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. On this section, we're going to talk about gizmos. We are going to give a brief overview of what are gizmos, what can you do with the gizmos and how to connect them with your scripts. We are going to tell you how to visualize data from your scripts with the gizmos. We are going to learn how to raycast and use the gizmos with your mouse. And finally, we are going to learn how to make the gizmos communicate and show data from other components. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by defining what's a gizmos. Gizmos are used to give visual debugging or setup aids in the scene view. Gizmos are used only for development, so you can see them on the scene view, but you cannot see them when the game is compiled or in the game view. There are different kind of gizmos, and they all depend on which components each game object has. For example, the camera has a small icon which is a gizmo, but if we select a cube, for example, it will also show the box collider, which you can see the green wired cube. Also, if you want to see the gizmos on the game view, you just click over the gizmos button on the game view. But remember that when you compile the project, you will not be able to see the gizmos. Now, if you want to set a custom icon, for any game object, you just select the game object and click over here. And here we can select the gizmos for that game object. Also, you can always set a custom icon, but you will need a texture on the project view to set that icon. Finally, we can always set which icons and which gizmos get displayed by enabling or disabling them. So if we uncheck the box collider, whenever we select this object, even though it has a box collider component, it will not be displayed as we don't have it selected here. Also, we can have the 3D gizmos. So when you get closer to them, they will get bigger. And if you have problems with the current size of the gizmo, when you have selected it, 
on 3D gizmos, you can always use this slider to make it bigger or smaller depending on where you are. So remember, gizmos are used to give visual debugging or set up aids in the scene view. You can enable or disable them on the game view, but remember that you will not be able to see them when you compile the project. You can always change the icons if you select the icon here, or you can always have custom icons if you have any texture in the project view. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. In the last video, we learned about gizmos. The gizmos that the engine has, how to modify the gizmos of each game object, how to access them, how to make them bigger or smaller, and also learn that gizmos can only be seen on the scene view. On this video, we're going to learn how to create our custom gizmos with our script and how to work with them. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating our C -sharp script and let's name it gizmos script. Second of all, let's create a folder and let's name it gizmos. Now, let's put our texture we have, the player icon, inside the gizmos folder. Finally, let's open our gizmos script, let's delete what it has and let's paste our code. Now that we have the code, let's start by making this a little bigger and let's start by explaining what these two functions do. So when we want to draw our own gizmos, we do that on two main functions. The first one is on draw gizmos and everything you do in this function will get drawn regardless the object is selected or not. Now, the other function is on draw gizmo selected and it's only used when you click over the object the gizmos has to work on. So in our case, what this code does, the on draw gizmos function, is that we're going to set, first of all, the color of our gizmos to blue. Then we are going to draw a sphere which has radius 0 0.2 and is going to be located two units in front of our forward position. Then what we're going to do is to draw a line from the center to where the sphere we just draw is located. And finally what we're going to do is to draw an icon in the main camera with the name of the texture we just moved to the gizmos folder. And we are going to tell the engine that we were going to allow the scaling of the icon we just created. Now, when we use the onDraw gizmo selected function, what we are going to do is to draw three lines that are going to define a field of view for our game object. And this field of view is going to be located from the center of the game object to three units in front of our game object. Now, if we save this file and go back to Unity, and attach the gizmos script to any of our game objects, let's say for example the cube, notice how regardless where the cube is, we are going to know always where's the forward position of the cube. Also notice that our player, regardless where it's located, is always easy to find because it has this icon. Finally, notice how when we select the cube, we are going to see the field of view of our game object. In the last video, we learned about how to program our custom gizmos. What are the functions that we need to override and some of the functions that are available for us to create our custom gizmos. On this video, we're going to learn how to make our small cube have depth for our field of view and size. And also, we're going to add an area explosion. With this, we're going to be able to visualize the data that we have on our scripts in our gizmos. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by opening the gizmos script and let's create three small bars, which are going to be the depth, the size, and another area of explosion. Now let's modify the lines we're drawing with the depth by multiplying them. And also let's do the same with the size. Finally, let's bind our area of explosion bar to our Gizmos the draw wire sphere, so we can draw a sphere where the position of the game object is binded to our bar that we created here. 
Also, let's change the color of the gizmos to yellow. Now, let's save our code and let's go back to Unity and see how it works. So we have our cube and we have our three bars exposed and when we increase the depth, it should increase the lines that we draw. Same for the size. And for the area of explosion, notice how the gizmos is yellow and it gets increased or decreased depending on what the values of the area of explosion bar has. Notice that we can have a negative depth. So we can control that by going again to the code and restraining the bars with a specific value. So let's say for example if the size is lesser than 1 then we set the size for 1. Same for the depth and on the case of the area of explosion it's less than 0 0.5 we set it to 0 0.5. Notice that these restrictions are here only for educational purposes, but these restrictions can be done on the start function or in any other place besides the on draw gizmo selected function. Now let's save this file and let's go see Unity how it works. So we have the def which is positive, but if I try to make it zero, I can't. I can't move it below one. Also same applies for the size. And in the case of the area of explosion, it doesn't let me make it smaller than 0.5. So remember, you can always bind any bar and make it work with your custom scripts on the gizmos. Also, remember that you can always force the bars to have certain specific values. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. On the last video, we learned how to visualize data that we have on our own script with our gizmos. So with this, we have now a visual aid for our bars in our scripts. On this video, we're going to learn how to cast a ray from our camera to any point where the mouse is placed. Now with this, we're going to learn also how to draw with a gizmo this ray, so we know where the ray is located. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating a seizure script and let's name it camera ray. Now, when we have the camera ray script, let's drag and drop the camera ray to our main camera. After we have done this, let's open our camera ray script. Let's delete the code and let's paste our code. Now, what this code does is that we are going to create a ray, which is the ray that we're going to cast, and a hit, which is a bar that is going to contain info of what the ray we created hits. Now, on the update render loop, we're going to call on the camera component a function that returns a ray by giving a screen point chord. So we pass the mouse position and it will return us a ray that is located from where the camera is, in this case the game object, and with the direction where the mouse position is. Now on the next line we cast a ray and we pass the ray we calculated here and we pass the info with the bar we created here. So this bar is going to get filled in the parameter if the ray casting returns true and with the distance of 100 units. Finally, if we hit something, we're going to access the heat information and access the transform of the heat and we are going to print the name on the console log. Also, notice that we left the ray and the ray cast heat outside as a class bar and that's because, first of all, we don't want to create the bars frame by frame and the other reason is because we need in order to visualize with our gizmos the ray here on the on draw gizmos function now here what we do is that we set the color of the gizmos we're going to draw to green and we draw the ray we also can draw the ray by just calling the ray the problem is that we're not going to see exactly the length of the ray so we do that by calling the ray with the transform position and the direction multiplied times 100 units now if we go back to Unity and hit play and we set the Y position to here, we can see that when we move the ray and we touch the cube, we're going to get printed over here the name on the log. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video.
In the last video, we learned about how to create and show a raycast on the gizmo side in order to see how the raycast behaves whenever the mouse is moving on the screen. On this video, we're going to learn how to make the camera ray component communicate with the gizmo script component that is located on the cube. With this, what we're going to do is that when we pass the mouse over the cube, we are going to make the cube be alert by showing a small yellow cube over the cube game object. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by opening our gizmo script and let's start by creating two bars and the update loop. With these two bars, we're going to set a flag if the object is being touched and a time counter. This time counter serves as a bar that is going to be updated each time the time that time, which is the time since the game started, gets bigger than the time counter. In this case, we're going to increase by one second the time counter. So this means that this if is going to be true each second. And by that being said, what that means is that each second we're going to set object being touched to false regardless the object is being touched or not. Now that we have done this, what we need to do on the Android Gizmos is to call the object being touched flag. And if it's set, we just set the Gizmos color to yellow. And then we just draw a cube, which is going to be where the object is positioned and a unit up from where the object is, with a cube size of 0.25 on each side. Now, if we save here and go to our camera ray component on the physics where the ray gets cast and when we have the heat info, what we need to do is to ask for the heat transform and know if it gets a component named gizmo script. Now, if it gets that a component, that means that we are touching our cube. And if we're touching our cube, what we just need to do is to access the transform of the heat info and get the component gizmos script and set the bar object being touched to true. That means that when we set it to true, what is going to happen is that we are going to set to yellow the gizmos and we are going to draw the cube we just mentioned it before. So let's try our code. Let's save first of all, and if we hit play, what we are going to see when we cast the green ray and hit the cube is a small little gizmos painted with yellow, which gets deactivated each second. Finally, if you need more info regarding the gizmos, you can always go to the docs and search for gizmos. And here you will get all the bars that are exposed for the gizmos. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. Hi, and welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. In this section, we're going to talk about character controllers. We're going to see a brief overview about the anatomy of a character controller, how it does it works, what does it do, when to use it. We're going to learn how to modify our character controller, the one that Unity provides, to work with our scripts. We also are going to make the character controller we just created that works with our scripts to work with the input system that Unity provides. We are going to create a first-person character controller. And finally, we're going to add movement to the character controller. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by talking about character controller. The character controller is a component that is mainly used for third-person or first-person player control. And it does not make use of any rigid body physics. So it easily allows you to do movement constrained by collisions without having to deal with any rigid body. It is also not affected by forcers, and it will only move when you call the move function, which we're going to see a couple of videos later. Now, in order to start working with our character controller, what we need to do is to create a floor for our character controller to stay. After that, we need to create a capsule, which is going to be our character controller. And then we need to replace the capsule collider of our capsule with our character controller. So we go to component physics, and add the character controller and ask if we want to replace the capsule collider and we say replace. Now let's quickly add a light by clicking on game object, create other and directional light in order to see correctly our character controller. And then let's start by explaining how does the character controller works. So the slope limit 
Limits to collider to only climb slopes that are equal or less than the indicated value, and it goes from 0 to 180. The step offset is used to let the character step up a stair only if it's closer to the ground than the indicated value. Now the skin width is used to let other colliders penetrate each other as deep as their skin width is. Larger skin width reduces jitter, but low skin width causes the character to get stuck. So if your character controller is getting stuck, it's always wise to increase the skin width. It is recommended also that the skin width is at 10% of the radius. Now regarding to the mean move distance, is the minimum distance that the character needs to move in order to move. So if there's a value below the mean move distance, the character will not move at all. Now we have the center of the capsule collider, which we can tweak. We also have the radius, which we can increase or decrease. And finally, we have the height. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. In the last video, we learned about the character controller and what are the sections that the character controller has. What is the slope limit, the step offset, the skin width, what's the mean move distance, how to tweak the center of the radius and the height. On this video, we're going to learn how to make our character controller jump with our script. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by showing shadows when the character controller is grounded. This is useful because with this, we're going to know visually when the character controller is touching the floor. So to do this, we go to directional light and set on shadow type to hard shadows. Now we have shadows on the character controller. Second of all, let's create a seizure script and let's name it character script. Now that we have our script, let's just open it. Let's delete this code and let's paste our code. Now here, what we have is two public bars which are going to be the jump speed and the gravity, which we can tweak from the inspector. We also have a move direction, with which is going to define where the character is going to move, if it's going to move forward, backwards, left, right, up. And finally, we have a reference of the character controller, the one we just created here, on the inspector, which is the character controller. Finally, what we do is that on the start function, we start by getting the component of our game object of type character controller and setting the reference controller that we use here. Now, on the update function, what we do frame by frame is that we ask if our controller is grounded. This is a bar specific from the character controller. And if the character controller is grounded, we capture the key code space. And if we hit space, what we do is that we're going to set the move direction to our jump speed, in our case, 5. Then, regardless if the controller is grounded or not, each frame we're going to subtract the gravity times the delta time. The delta time is the time that it takes to complete a frame. And we do this, this multiplication, in order to make this code frame independent. Finally, on the next line and at the end of this render loop, we move our character controller towards the move direction direction, which in our case is only on the y direction. So let's check the code. Let's save here and let's quickly drag and drop our character script to our capsule where the character controller is attached. Now if we hit play, we can see that when we press a space, the capsule itself jumps. Notice how if I change the gravity, it gets reflected. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. In the last video, we learned about how to make our character controller get communicated with our scripts. So with this, we can communicate our character script with our character controller. And by doing that, we programmed in the last video how to make our character control jump. On this video, we're going to learn how to make our character controller work with our input system. So with this, we're going to be able to make it move with our keyboard. 
So let's get started. First of all, let's go and see our input manager by going to edit project settings and input. Let's open our input manager and we just need the horizontal and vertical axis. So we're just going to leave the size of the array to two. Second of all, let's open our character script and let's paste our code. So we start by creating a speed bar, which is going to determine how fast we move when we press the horizontal and vertical axis. And after that, what we need to do is to finally modify the move direction depending on which keys we press. So to do that, what we're going to do is to capture the movement of our axis when the controller is grounded. So let's do that. So what we do here is that we set the move direction depending on the axis we capture from our input manager, in this case, the horizontal and vertical, which are binded by default to the ASDW keys. A and D for left and right, and W and S for forward or backwards. Now on the next line, we set again the move direction to be relative to our camera. So with this, if our camera is rotated, it will not matter if we hit left or right, depending on where the camera is. And finally, we multiply our move direction by the speed. Then we capture the space key being pressed in order to make the character controller jump. We calculate afterwards the gravity, and then we move our character with the gravity and the move direction. So let's check it out. Let's save here, and let's go back to Unity. Let's hit play and see how if I press the A, S, and S, and D buttons, the capsule moves. Now, if I wanted to change the camera position and rotation, you would think that the position of the ASD changes, but it doesn't because of this line of the transform direction. So if I rotated the camera and move my character, it will move the same with the ASD and W functions. So remember that if you want to use the movement of your character controller relative to something, you use the transform direction function. In the last video, we learned how to connect with our character controller in system. With this, we could move the character controller around the floor. On this video, what we're going to learn is how to create a first person character controller. With this, we can control with the mouse our character controller and move around. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by parenting our main camera with our character controller. So, we're going to make the main camera child of our capsule. Now, let's reset the position of our main camera and let's move it a little bit up. After we have finished setting the camera, we go to our input manager by clicking on edit project settings, input, and we are going to add two more axes, and we are going to name them one for mouse X, and remember to set the type to mouse movement, and the other one is going to be named mouse Y. Also, we set the type to mouse movement and change the axis to the Y axis. Finally, let's create a C -share script, and let's name it camera look. Now, let's open our camera look script, let's delete the code that it comes, and let's paste our code. Now on the code, we're going to have a sensitivity bar to tweak how fast the camera moves when our mouse moves. We're going to restrict the white movement to a minimum and a maximum, which we can tweak later from the inspector. And we're going to have two private bars, named rotation Y and rotation X, which we're going to use on the update loop. Now on this render loop, we're going to use rotation X to store the degrees we want to move horizontally. So we're going to add our current rotation on our Y axis to the input we get with our mouse delta on the horizontal movement times the sensitivity. Now regarding the rotation Y, what we're going to do is to add the current value of this bar to the delta of the vertical movement of our mouse times the sensitivity. And afterwards, what we're going to do is to clamp the value that we got here 
with the minimum and the maximum parameters that we set on the inspector. Finally, with the rotation x and rotation y calculated, we build up a vector tree with the new coordinates and set them to our rotation of our current transform. Notice that the minus sign is here in order to set up correctly the horizontal movement of our mouse. So, let's see how it works. Let's save here. Let's go back to Unity. Let's locate our main camera game object and let's drag and drop our camera look script. Now let's hit play mode and if we move our mouse, we're going to rotate the camera where our mouse moves. We can also move our player with the input system. So that's pretty much. See you in the next video. In the last video, we learned how to control our character controller with our mouse movement. So with this, we were able to create a first-person character controller. On this video, what we're going to learn is how to create a third-person character controller. But the thing is that we are going also to learn how to activate the animations of our character controller. So with this, our character will look and move depending on the movements we do. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by unparenting our main camera. So let's drag and drop it outside to any point of the hierarchy. Next, let's disable our camera look, so our camera won't move. Now, let's move our camera a little bit back, so we can see our character. Let's disable our capsule, and let's also check on the project view our mesh. Now our mesh has different values, but what we are going to focus is on the animations. So we have four animations, which we are going to use only three. Idle, walk, and jump pose. Idle, let's set it to loop. Let's set to run, also loop. Let's set walk to loop. And the jump pose, we are going to set it to ping pong. The ping pong animation consists that the character will do all the animation and when it finishes, it will go backwards to the start point. Let's hit apply and that's pretty much. Now let's drag and drop our constructor here and let's move it a little bit up. Now that we have our character here, let's drag and drop our character script and let's add a component of a character controller by clicking on component, physics, character controller. Now, let's displace our center of our capsule on the character controller a little bit up, so when the character hits the ground, we can see that it's touching the ground. Finally, let's open our character script and let's paste our code. So what this code does is that we make sure that we have a component of type animation before we can do anything. Then we have the component animation, but the capture is our vertical movement. If you're moving, then we're going to Set our speed, positive or negative, depending on what the user presses when the vertical input gets captured. And then we are going to do a crossfade to the walk animation. Else, if we are not pressing anything, we are just going to play the idle animation. Afterwards, we are going to do the same for the jump pose. We capture our space key, and if the character is not grounded, what we're going to do is that we're going to set a speed to half the speed, and then what we're going to do is a crossfade to the animation. Now, let's save here, let's go back to Unity, let's hit play, and let's see how it works. So if I move backwards, the animation will reproduce backwards. If I move forward, it will reproduce forward. And if I jump, it will make the jump animation. Hi. And welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. In this section, we're going to talk about the GUI scripting. So we're going to take a look about our GUI overview and the type of controls that the engine offers. We're going to talk about how to place manually on our screen our controls. We're also going to take a look about the GUI layout, which is a way of placing the controls automatically. Also, we're going to mix the GUI system with the input system. So we're going to cover cases, for example, when we display a window and we want to press, instead of the button to press OK, we just press Enter. 
and we're going to capture those events. And finally, we're going to skin our created GUI. So let's get started. On this video, we're going to talk about the different GUIs that Unity offers. Even though the new GUI system that comes with Unity 4 is not out yet, as Unity is not able to deliver on the Unity 4 launch, we're going to talk about the current GUI system that the engine offers. So we have two types of GUI system. The current one, that is the one that we are seeing on the bottom left of the screen, and the old one, which is just going to be shown for educational purposes. So we, on the old times, we had a GUI text and a GUI texture. And these two game objects were used for GUI. But the thing is that they used viewport coordinates instead of screen coordinates. And viewport coordinates go from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Finally, notice that when you use the main camera for rendering, we have a GUI layer component. And the thing is that this GUI layer only affects the old GUI. So if we disable it, we are going to see the old GUI. Now the controls that we can use on our engine are a box, which is this big rectangle that is behind all of these controls. We can use labels. We can use also textures with transparency. Toggles. We can activate or deactivate our GUI. We have buttons. We have a special kind of button that is a selection grid, which is a group of buttons that get only one selected at the same time. We also have sliders. And we have scroll bars, which are a special control that let us put inside a reduced area more controls. So inside of this scroll bar, we have labels, a text field, a password field, and another texture. Now we can mix all of them and create amazing GUIs. In the last video, we learned about the different Unity GUI components that the engine has. On this video, we're going to learn how to program them. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating a seizure script and let's name it GUI system. Second of all, let's drag and drop our GUI system to our main camera. Notice that this seizure script can be dragged to any other object, but in this case, as we only have one game object, we're dragging it here. Now, let's open our seizure script. Let's delete this and let's paste our code. So what we do here is that we are going to create an ungui render loop and we are going to create a function which is going to be located here, which is going to be called manual GUI. And on the manual GUI function, we're going to draw our GUI. So first of all, we call a GUI the box function, which we pass a rect and we don't give to the box any title. Bear in mind that any function on the GUI always receives a rect. And this rect is on screen core, so it goes from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. And in this case, goes to the fourth of the screen width to the bottom of the screen. The same thing applies to the label. So we create a rect with x, y chords and a width and a height. And then we draw our string. That's the same for drawing a texture. We pass a rect and then we pass the reference of the texture. Now for the toggle, we receive a rect where we want to draw our toggle. We receive a boolean value that is going to tell us which value has the toggle and then a string. Notice that the value that we receive here on the function is the value that we change. Next, we enable or disable our GUI depending on the value we calculated here. Afterwards, we create two buttons and the button receives the same parameters, a rect for the positioning and a string but you can also pass a texture. Afterwards, we draw another button and then we draw a selection grid, which is a special kind of control, which consists of a group of buttons, which one only is selected at the same time. So to do this, we pass the parameter of where it's going to be located. We pass an index of which button is going to be selected. We pass an array of textures or strings, on this case strings. 
And then we pass an integer which will tell us how many elements we are going to fit on the horizontal direction. Next, we create an horizontal slider where we pass the position where it's going to be, the value that we're going to change, which is the same value that it returns, the left value and the right value. So what we are doing here is that we're modifying the selection grid X count on our selection grid. Finally, we enable to through our GUI and then we create a scroll view. Now on the scroll view, we pass the rectangle on the screen to use for the scroll view. A scroll position, which is a vector 2, using for the two scrolls that we have, the horizontal and vertical, and our view rec, which is going to be the rectangle using inside the scroll view. Now inside the scroll view, we create a label, a text field, a password field, and draw a texture. Notice how the rects that are inside the scroll view change, and these rects are relative to the rectangle that we use inside the scroll view. Finally, we end the scroll view here. In the last video, we learned how to create different controls and manually place them on our GUI. In this video, we're going to talk about some of the controls that we created on the last video and how to automatically place them. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating a C -share script and let's name it Automatic GUI System. Second of all, let's drag and drop our C -share script to our main camera. We can also create the same automatic system that we're going to program on the old c -sharp script. But for easiness of reading of the code, we are going to create it on another c -sharp script. Now, let's open our created script. Let's delete the code that it comes and let's paste our code. So basically, when drawing GUI layouts, the main thing to understand is that we draw on canvas or on areas. So what we do here is that we create an area for drawing and we pass a rect of the area we want to draw, which in this case is the third of the screen to the end of the screen. And then we draw a box. And then automatically the layout gets placed. So we don't need to pass a rect as we needed to do on the last section. Now here I'm passing to the box also an option. And what I'm telling it is to create a box of a height of screen height. If I didn't pass this parameter, then the box will be created with only the string size. So let me show you real quick. If we save here and then hit place, what we will see is that the box is only of the size of our string. Now if we go back to the code and put our code how it was, notice that afterwards we end the area we created here. And this area is only created for the box in order to draw the box on the back. And then we create a new area with the difference that is going to be 20 pixels below of the first area. And this new area is going to be for drawing the controls over the box that we created here. Now on this area, we start by telling the engine to start ordering our controls on vertical order and then we draw a string. We also draw a texture, which is referenced here. And then we create a space of 40 pixels vertically. We also create a toggle, and then we enable the GUI depending on the toggle value. And then we tell the engine to start ordering all of the next controls in horizontal mode. So we create two buttons, one next to the other horizontally and then we end the horizontal order we also end the vertical order and finally we end our area in the last video we learned how to place automatically controls on our GUI on this video we're going to learn how to connect our input system with our GUI in order to be able with a letter of the keyboard call a window. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by opening our automatic GUI system script. Then let's start by creating the position where we're going to place our window. Also, let's create a flag in order to show or hide our window. And these two bars, we're going to discuss it later. Then let's create a function 
that is going to draw the window we are going to create. Afterwards, let's insert an input system call here, so in order that when we press the button, or when we press the O key, this button is going to be called. Now, let's fill the logic of when we press the button. So what we are going to do is that we are going to set to true the displaying window flag, then we are going to count how many times the button gets called. Finally, let's call the window when the flag is set to true. So when we call the function of the window, what we are going to do is that we are going to place horizontally a small texture, which is in this case the A texture, and then we are going to put a simple string. Then we are going to create a space of 30 pixels, and then we hit the button accept, we are going to set the flag to false, and then we are not going to show the window. The window parameters consist of a unique integer for each window, which can be any number, a window rectangle that defines the size of the window, and a function that is used to draw the contents of the window. Finally, it has the title of the window. Now if we go back to Unity and hit play, notice that when I click the open window button, the log appears once, but if I hit the key, the O key, it gets called four times. And this is because the on GUI render loop gets called several times per frame. So in order to fix this, what we do is that we capture the key down pressed and we use the flag that we created here and set it to false. When it enters the first time, the key is pressed. And then we set the same flag to true when we release the key. Finally, what we need to do is to ask with an AND for the flag. And that's pretty much. Now if we go back to Unity and hit play again and clear the console, if we press the O key, it gets called the log once, as we need it. On the last video, we learned how to mix the input manager system with our GUI. So with this, we were able to mimic the mouse pressing with our keys, in order to make the same key presses on the on GUI render loop. On this video, we're going to learn how to dress our current GUI system with custom skins. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by opening the script we want to dress. And let's create a public bar of type GUI skin. Now, let's go to the on GUI render loop and assign to a GUI that skin our public bar. Now, let's save and go back to Unity, and if we right click, let's click on Create, GUI Skin. Here we have our GUI Skin. Now what we need to do is to fill our GUI Skin. So we have our general font for the GUI Skin, and each of the controls of the GUI has its own font, as you can see here. So in order to fix and to fill the new GUI Skin that we have created, we need to fill with textures each of the fields that the our GUI skin has. So we have our box and we have an a normal state. We have an over state, so we need to fill a texture here. And we have to do that for all the controls that our GUI skin has. So in order to speed up things, what we're going to do is that we're going to import a custom package that Unity provides and is the extra GUI skin package. So we've searched it and it's located on the web page. So you can download it from there and then just import the package. So with the package imported, now we have all the skins filled with textures that we need. And these textures are on these folders. So each of the skins has their own group of textures. So if we go to our script that we created and then drag and drop our current GUI skin, which is the one that we want to use and hit play, what we're going to see is the new GUI skin. Now with the new GUI skin that we have applied to our current controls, 
we also can change our skin and it will change automatically. Notice that there are certain cases that the GUI skin cannot feel correctly, which is the case of the Amiga 500 GUI skin. And that's because the controls and the textures of the current GUI skin that are displayed are not organized correctly. So you need to tweak all of the controls that each of the GUI controls of the GUI skin has. Hi, and welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. On this section, we're going to talk about the AI pathfinding. We're going to give a small overview about the AI pathfinding system, how to use it, what are the measures that we can use, and how to bake them. Then we're going to move to a component of the AI pathfinding, which are the NavMesh agents. We're going to also give an overview of the off-mesh links. Then we're going to learn how to connect our AI system to interact with our custom scripts. And finally, we're going to create a basic sandbox for playing with our agents. So let's get started. First of all, let's we'll start by creating a plane where our characters are going to walk. And then let's reset its position. Let's also create a river by duplicating our plane. And let's put it next to our plane. Let's name this game object river. And let's duplicate our created plane to create the other side of the river. Now let's organize our main camera so it can see all the planes that we created. After doing that, let's open the navigation window so we can create the AA pathfinding. But before we use anything of this, we have to set all the planes and river on our inspector and mark them as static by selecting the navigation static option. Now, the primary task of the navigation system is finding the optimal path between two points in a navigation space. So, in this case, the optimal path is the shortest path. However, in some complex environments, some areas are harder to move through than the others. For example, on our case, the river. Now, to model this, Unity uses the concept of cost, and the optimal path is defined as the path with the lowest cost. So, in order to manage cost, what we use is the concept of nav mesh layers, and we can open them by going to Edit, Project Settings, Nav Mesh Layers. So here we have all the layers with the cost that our AI pathfinding system uses. And so we are going to create a layer that is going to be the water and we're going to assign a cost of three. Finally, we go to the navigation tab and then select the river. And then we click on the layer and select water. Then we click bake and everything on the scene filter that is marked as navigation static gets calculated. Now we also can tweak some bars if we hit bake. And the general bars are the radius of the typical agent that we're going to have on our scene, the height as well of the typical agent, the max slope, so if we have a slope that is bigger than 45 degrees, then the agent is not going to be able to climb. And finally, we have the step height, which is the height difference below which nav mesh regions are considered to be connected. On the other hand, these bars are related to the off mesh links, and these bars are related to tweaks when generating the navigation mesh. In the last video, we learned how to create and bake all the nav mesh layers, how to add cost to each of the layers and how to set up each of the layers in order to work with the navigation system. On this video, we're going to learn how to set up an agent, what are the bars that work with the agent, and how to use them. So, let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating some light in our scene. Second of all, let's start by creating a capsule where we're going to put our agent. Finally, let's add the NavMesh component by going to Component, Navigation, NavMesh Agent. Now, the NavMesh Agent component is used in connection with the pathfinding and is the place where you put information about how this agent navigates the NavMesh that we have baked. So, as the same as the character controller, the NavMesh Agent is a component that is used to move the agents on the scene. Now, we have some bars here that we're going to talk about. So we have the radius, which is the agent radius, 
and is used only for pathfinding purposes, and it can differ from the actual object's radius, which is typically larger. So we can increase it or decrease it, and it will not affect the collider of the object itself. We also have the speed, which is the maximum movement speed with which the agent can traverse the world toward where the agent is needed to go. Also, we have the maximum acceleration the agent is going to reach, as well as the angular speed, which is the maximum rotation speed in degrees per second. Now, on the stopping distance, the agent will decelerate when within the distance to the destination. We also have the auto traverse of mesh links and is to automate the movement onto and off of a mesh link. We also have the auto repath, which is when the agent acquires new path if existing path is partial or invalid. Let's say, for example, when the agent is moving to certain destination and between the agent and the destination is a door and then we close it, then the agent auto repaths the path to the destination. We can also use the height, which is the agent height, and also the base offset, which is the vertical offset of the collision geometry relative to the actual geometry. Finally, we have the obstacle avoidance type, which is the level of quality of the avoidance. And remember that if we use high quality, it's going to consume more processor than if we use low quality. So we have to balance these values depending on how many agents we're going to use in our scene. And at the end, we have the nav mesh walkable value, which specifies the types of nav mesh layers that the agent can traverse. In the last video, we learned how to set up a nav mesh agent game object. We also learned each of the values that the nav mesh agent component has and how to use them. On this video, we're going to learn how to connect separated meshes with each other on the navigation system. So with this, with the off-mesh links, we can connect, for example, a floor with a bridge. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by dragging the textures of the floor to our meshes, and then the water texture. Second of all, let's place our cube on the bridge. Then, let's create another cube and let's move it to the right side. Finally, let's duplicate the cube and let's create the top side of the river. And then, let's mark the cubes as static, so we can bake again the navigation mesh. Then, let's scale our top of the bridge and let's name the game object Bridge. And then, let's drag and drop the wood texture to our bridge. Then, let's create the empty game objects that are going to act as our off mesh links. And let's name each of the game objects. So we're going to name the one on the left with left to bridge because it's the off mesh link which goes from the left side of the bridge. And then the other game object with bridge to right because it's the off mesh link that goes from the bridge to the right side. Finally, what we need to do is to add the off mesh link components to the two empty game object that we have just created by going to component, navigation, off mesh links. Then we need to fill each of the reference of each of the off mesh links. So in the case of the left to bridge, the start point is going to be the same game object and the end point is going to be our bridge. And in the case on the bridge to right on the off mesh link, the start point is going to be the bridge and then the endpoint is going to be the same empty game object, bridge to right. Finally, what we need to do is to clear the bake and nav mesh layer and then rebake the nav mesh. So now that we have set up all the off mesh links, we can see in detail the off mesh link component, where we have a start point of the off mesh link and an endpoint of the off mesh link. We also have a cost of ride, which is the cost by going through the off mesh link. Now, by default, it uses the cost which the layer belongs to. Now, if we, for example, set it to 3, moving over the off-mesh link will be 3 times more expensive than moving the same distance on a default nav-mesh area. Now, if the bidirectional value is set to on, the link can be traversed in both ways. If it's off, the link can only be traversed in the direction from start to end. Finally, 
the activated value specifies if this link is actually used by the pathfinder. If it's set to false, the off-match link will be disregarded. Also, the activated and cost override properties can be changed at runtime and will have immediate effect. In the last video, we learned how to organize and set off-match links, how they work, and what are the different values that the off-match links have. On this video, we're going to learn how to make our agent that we created on the last videos move depending on when the mouse clicks. So let's get started. First of all, let's create a folder where we're going to store our scripts. Then inside this folder, we're going to create two c scripts. One is going to be named Player Handler. The other one is going to be named Agent Handler. Now let's move our Agent Handler script to our capsule. And this script is going to be in charge of moving our agent. On the other side, the player handler, let's drag and drop it to our main camera and this script is going to be in charge of capturing the mouse buttons so we can select where we want to move our agent. Then let's open our player handler script and let's paste our code. So what this code does is that we're going to have a public game object which is going to be the reference to the agent we're going to move. Then we're going to call a private write and a private write cast hit. And with this, we are going to calculate a ray from where the camera is to where the mouse position is located on the screen cords. And with this, if the right cast hits something with a distance of 100 units on the world space, when we press the left mouse button, what we're going to do is that we're going to call the agent handler component that we just created but we haven't filled yet and we are going to call a move function with the point we hit on the screen. Now let's save here and let's go to the angel handler script. And finally let's fill our code. Now what this code does is that we're going to have a reference of an admesh agent and we're going to name it agent. Then on the start function we are going to fill the reference that we just created here by getting the component of type nightmares agent. And if by any reason we don't find the component, we are going to print an error saying that we didn't find the navmesh agent component on this game object. And finally, we're going to create a function that we're going to call on the player handler script. And what we do is that we pass a position where we want to set the destination of our agent. So with this destination call, we just set the position and the agent automatically moves to where the position is. Now if we go back to Unity and set on the main camera the reference of the capsule that we want to move and we hit play, what we're going to see is the navigation system working. So if we click anywhere, the agent is going to follow our mouse. In the last video, we learned how to connect our agents with our scripts in order to move them around our world. On this video, we're going to learn how to create a small sandbox in order to activate or activate doors and move various objects. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating two cubes that are going to be our doors. And let's name these two cubes left door and right door. Now let's set each position of each of our doors. Now that we have the doors placed, what we're going to do is to duplicate our agents. So we are going to be able to select any of our agents. Finally, let's open our agent handler script and we're going to add two functions, a select and an unselect function. So when we select it, we're going to paint the agent with a red color. And when we unselect the game object, what we're going to do is to return and paint the game object to white. Now let's save here and let's go to our player handler script. Now let's start by adding six bars. The first two are going to be reference of the off mesh link and our game object that we just created for the left door. 
Then we're going to have as well a reference for the right door and an alchemist link for the right link. And finally, we're going to have two private bars that are going to be flags and are going to tell us when to activate the alchemist link and the game object renderer. Now let's create the start function and on this function we're going to deactivate the two alchemist links as our doors are going to be closed at the beginning. Now let's organize the code when we press the bounce button. So what this code does is that depending on the object we select, if it has an agent handler component, what we're going to do is that if the selected game object is different from null, we're going to unselect the currently selected game object. Then we're going to set the selected game object bar with the new agent. And finally, we mark this agent as selected. Now on the other hand, if the object we click it doesn't have an agent handler, it means that we click it a place where we want to move the current selected game object. So in case where the current selected game object is different from null, then what we do is that we move the object where we hit with the mouse button. Finally, what we do is that we create an ongoing render loop with two buttons, and what we do on each of the buttons is that, first of all, when we click the button, we change the state of the flag. Then we enable or disable the value of the renderer of each of the doors, depending on the flag, and as well, we enable or disable the off-mesh links. Finally, we need to save here and go back to Unity, and then fill the reference that we have on our main camera. And after doing that, we are good to go to play with our agents. We can close and open our doors, make our agents move, etc. Hi, and welcome to getting started with Unity 4 scripting. In this section, we're going to cover more advanced topics about script compilation order and mixing languages in Unity. So we're going to take a look at stuff like script execution order in Unity so we can manually tell the engine which scripts that we create get executed first. We are also going to talk about the script compilation order in Unity, the functions execution order in Unity, how can we mix languages in Unity, and finally we're going to have a small sample where we're going to call JavaScript functions from C Sharp. So let's get started. On this video, we're going to learn how to force the engine to first call the script tree, then the script two, then the script one. And with this, we're going to make three logs, each one from each of the scripts. So first of all, let's start by creating three seizure scripts and let's name them script one, script two, and script three. After that, let's drag and drop each of the scripts to our main camera. So with this, we're going to make all of the three scripts execute. Now, let's open each of the scripts, let's delete its contents, and let's create a debug.log on the awake function. Let's do this by the script 1, and also for the script 2, and finally for the script 3. Now, let's save our three scripts and let's go back to Unity and let's say we want to print first the first script, then the third, and then the second. Now, if we hit play, we're going to get an arbitrary execution order. So with this, we're getting first the third script, then the second script, and then the first script. So in order to solve this, what we do is that we go to Edit, Project Settings, and then Script Execution Order. And here we are going to get a mono manager window. And with this window, we are going to force the engine to execute certain scripts. So we add our scripts, we want to force the execution order, and then we just modify the order here. Notice that we also have a default time bar, and this represents all the scripts that are not in the custom order. So we also can make the engine execute scripts before the default time. Finally, these numbers at the right of each of the scripts only represent the order. So it will be the same if we put minus one and one if we respect this order. Now we just need to hit apply 
And then if we hit play, what we're going to get is firstly executed the second script, then the first one, and then the third script. In the last video, we learned how to organize the project execution order from our scripts. So when we hit play, we can force the engine to execute certain scripts before others. On this video, we're going to learn how the compilation process works in Unity. So let's get started. So Unity's compilation process is performed in four steps and is dependent on where the scripts are located. Now, if we focus on the project view, what we can see is certain scripts located on certain folders. So on the first step, the scripts that are inside the plugins or pro standard assets or standard assets are compiled first. The scripts in one of these folders can directly access the scripts outside of these folders. But if you want to communicate with them, you can use the game object that send message. So in this case, the script 1a, script 1b, and the script 1c are the scripts that are going to be compiled first. Now in the next step, we get compiled all the editor scripts that are inside the plugins, pro standard assets, and standard assets folder. So as you can see, all the editor folders that are inside these three folders are compiled next. These scripts that are inside the editor folder are the ones that are used for Unity editor scripts. So in this case, what we get compiled are the editor script 2a, the editor script 2b, and editor script 2c. Also, all the scripts that are compiled on the second step can access the scripts from the previous group. Now on the third step, we get compiled all the scripts that are not located on the previous folders we have discussed, and also not in the editor folders. So in our case, we get compiled all the scripts that are inside the unit scripts folder. Also, all the scripts that are compiled in this step has access to all the scripts in the group standard assets, pro standard assets, and plugins folder. This allows you to let different scripting language interoperate, so you can call functions from these groups on the third compiling step. Finally, on the last step, everything that is inside the editor folder is compiled last. So all the editor scripts that are in this folder can access all the previous group. So in this case, the last group of scripts that are going to be compiled is the script 4a. Additionally, all the stuff and the scripts that gets inside the web player templates folder is not compiled at all. So as you can see, if we create a C-sharp script inside the web player templates folder, then the icon gets blanked out, and that's because everything that is inside this folder is not compiled at all. In the last video, we learned about the compiling process and the steps that the Unity engine does for compiling our scripts. On this video, we're going to talk about the number of event functions that get executed for each of the scripts that we have on the engine. So let's get started. In Unity scripting, there are a number of event functions that get executed in a predetermined order as the script executes. And this execution order works like this. On the first scene load, we have available two functions. The awake, which is always called before any start function, and the unenable function, which is only called if the object is active. These functions get called when a scene starts and once for each object in the scene. Then we have the start function which is called before the first frame of date only if the script instance is enabled. Then after the start function we get in between the frames the an application pause function and is called when the app loses focus if it's a standalone or when an iOS app when the app is pushed to the background. This function is called at the end of the frame where the pause is detected. Now then we have the update order. So we have the fixed update and it's often called more frequently than the update. It can be called multiple times per frame if the frame rate is low and it might not be called between frames at all if the frame rate is high. Then we have the update which gets called frame by frame and then when the update has finished we get the late update call. Now on the rendering step we get the unprecool call which is called just before the object gets visible on the camera. Then we have the unbecame visible invisible 
and it gets called when the object gets visible or invisible to any camera. Then we have the on-wheel render object that is called once for each camera if the object is visible. After that, we have the unpre render, which is called just before the camera starts rendering the scene. Then on render object, which is called after all regular scene rendering is done. After that, on post renderer gets called when the camera finishes rendering the scene. Then on render image, which is used for image effects. Then on GUI render loop, which is called multiple times per frame respond to GUI events. And finally on draw gizmos, which is used for drawing gizmos in the scene view. After that, if an object gets destroyed, if it gets destroyed by calling object that destroy or changing to another scene, we have the undestroy function. And finally, when we quit, we have the on application quit and on disable function. So in conclusion, this is the execution order for any given script. Call the all the way calls, then the start calls, and while stepping towards in the time, we call the all fixed update functions, then the physics simulation, then we have the on trigger exit triggers and collider functions. Then we do rigid body interpolations that applies to the position and rotation of the transform. Then we capture the bands of on mouse down up or stay. Then we call all the update functions. All the animations gets advanced, blended or applied to any transform. Then all the late update functions get called and finally the rendering process gets done. In the last video, we learn about the different functions that get called on every mono behavior that gets used in Unity. On this video, we're going to learn how to mix the different languages that the engine supports on the same scene. So with this, we're going to be able to make rotate the different cubes on the different languages. So let's get started. First of all, let's start by creating the cubes we're going to use for rotating on each of the languages. So we're going to use on the left U, on the middle JavaScript, and on the right C sharp. Next, let's drag each of the textures that represent each of the language that we're going to use. So on the left boom, as we say, on the middle JavaScript, and on the right C sharp. Then let's create, let's name it. After that, let's create a JavaScript and let's name it JS. Test. And finally, let's create a seizure script and let's name it CS test. After that, let's drag and drop each of the scripts to each of the game objects. So let's select the JavaScript cube and let's drag and drop the JS test. And let's do that as well for the C sharp. Now let's open each of the scripts, in this case the C sharp test, and let's paste our code. Let's do the same for the JavaScript one. And finally, let's open the boot test and let's paste the final code. So basically, the code that we created on the c -sharp on the Boo and the JavaScript test does the same thing. The only difference is that it's written differently. So for example, on the boot test, we create a public bar name speed, a private bar name movement, which is the, of type vector. We declare functions with dev and then the name of the function. And if the function is empty, we just type pass. Now, in order to the code know when a function ends, this is done via the identation. So, for example, everything that is identified after the declaration of the function belongs to the update function. So, in this case, these two lines belong to the update function. So, basically, what the code does is that each frame we update the movement bar by calculating the movement of the axis horizontal on the input manager multiply it times the speed and times the delta time in order to make it frame independent. And finally, what we add is the calculated movement to the object's rotation. Now on the JavaScript side, we're going to see a similar declaration as the C-sharp ones. The only difference is that we have here pragma strict, and this is to force the engine to static typing. And what this means is that we have to declare the type of the bar on each of the bars that we are declaring. And this is done for making our code faster. So basically, you can use any language or three languages in the same scene. The main thing is that you cannot call functions from one language on another language. On the last video, we learned how to mix different languages on the same scene with the engine. So with this, we were able to use Boo, JavaScript, and C-sharp on the same scene and at the same time. 
we also learned that we can call and use any component and any other made component only if we were using the same scripting language. Now in this video, we're going to learn how to mix different languages in Unity. In specific, we're going to learn how to call JavaScript functions from C Sharp. So with this, when we put the mouse over the C Sharp cube, we're going to disappear the JavaScript cube. And when we release the mouse, we're going to make the cube of the JavaScript code appear again. So let's get started. First of all, in order to make interaction between languages and function calls, we need to remember the compiling step process that the engine does. So with this, we have to remember that first we get compiled the plugins, pro standard assets, and standard assets folder. Then, after that, we get compiled the editor folders that are inside the plugins, pro standard assets, and standard assets. And these editor folders are only used for editor scripting. After that, we get compiled everything that is outside of these three folders. And finally, we get compiled the editor folder. Now, with this in mind, the second group can access the first group of the compiled folders. The third can access the second and the first, and so on. So with this, we can move our JavaScript test to, let's say, the standard assets folder. And with this, after this gets compiled, then we can know and access from our blue or c -sharp scripts this JavaScript. So now that we have organized the different scripts and the different folders, let's open our JavaScript test and let's create a function for enable or disable the rendering on this script. Then let's create the reference to the JavaScript test on our c -sharp script. And finally, let's create the two overrides for calling the JavaScript script. So with this, when the mouse enters at our C sharp cube, what we're going to do is to call on the JavaScript file the disable enable rendering that we created here on the JavaScript test. And when the mouse exits, we're going to call the same function but with different arguments so we can enable the rendering of the JavaScript. Finally, let's save here and let's go back to Unity and let's fill the reference from our C sharp script with the cube of the JavaScript file. So let's drag and drop this, and here we have our reference. Now if we save and hit play, what we're going to see is that the function gets called when we put the mouse over the C-sharp cube, and gets called again when we release the mouse. 